anything to add to Dhamma Bhagavan by rendering his service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome within the heart becomes destroyed to practically meal. And thus loving service unto the glorious Lord who is praised with transcendental becomes established is an irrevocable, an irrevocable, irrevocable fact. Shiva Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 2, The Lord in the Heart, verse number 3. Can I go on the board, you said? Yeah. Atta, Atta, Kavir, Kavir, Mamasu, Mamasu, Namasu, Namasu, Yavad, Yavad, Atta, 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 Kavir, Namasu, Yavadatta, Ya Kavir, Namasu, Yavadatta, Shat, Shat, Apramato, Apramato, Yavasya, Shaya, Puri, Shara Pramato, Viva Shaya, Puri, Shara Pramato, Viva Shaya, Puri, Sede, Sede, and Yatarte, and Yatarte, Nana, Yateta, Yateta, Tatra, Tatra. Siddhinya Tate na yate tatra Siddhinya Tate na yate tatra Parishwamam Parishwamam tatra tatra Nichamanaha Nichamanaha Parishwamam tatra Nichamanaha Parishwamam tatra Nichamanaha Ataka vir namasu yavad artha. Ataka vir namasu yavad artha. Shara buri. Siddhena tate na yate tatra. Siddhena tate na yate tatra. Parishwaman tatra samikshamanaha. <laughs> Yavad, I was combining them. Yavad, Yavad, okay. Shara Pramato, Vyavasaya Budi. Shara Pramato, Vyavasaya Budi. Siddhin Yatate, Nayate Tatra. Siddhin Yatate, Nayate Tatra. Parishamam Tatra Samikshamanaha Parishamam Tatra Samikshamanaha Tate na yate tatra. Parishramam tatra samikshamanaha. Parishramam tatra samikshamanaha. Ataka vil nama su yavara tata. Ataka vil nama su yavara tata. Shara Pramato Vyavasaya Bhuti. Shara Pramato Vyavasaya Bhuti. Sid Sidhe Nartate Nayate Tatatra. Sidhe Nartate Nayate Tatatra. Parishramam Tatra Samikshama Naha. Parishramam Tatra Samikshama Naha. Ataka 
buildings, furniture, cars, bungalows, mills, factories, industries, peace, war, or even the highest perfection of material science, namely atomic energy and electronics, are all simply bewildering names of material elements with their concomitant reactions of the three modes. Since the devotee of the Lord knows them perfectly well, he is not interested in creating unwanted things. For a situation which is not at all reality, but simply names of no more significance than the babble of sea waves, the great kings, leaders, and soldiers fight with one another in order to perpetuate their names in history. They are forgotten in due course of time, and they make a place for another era in history. But the devotee realizes how much history and historical persons are useless products of flickering times. The fruited worker aspires after a big fortune in the matter of wealth, woman, and worldly adoration, that those who are fixed in perfect reality are not at all interested in such false things. For them it is all a waste of time. For every second of human life is important. An enlightened man should be very careful to utilize time very cautiously. One second of human life wasted in the vain research of planning for happiness in the material world can never be replaced. Even if one spends millions of coins of gold, therefore, the transcendentalist desiring freedom from the clutches of Maya or the illusory activities of life is warned herewith not to be captivated by the external features of fruitive actives. <clears throat> Human life is never meant for sense gratification, but for self-realization. Srima Bhagavatam instructs us solely on this subject from the very beginning to the end. Human life is simply meant for self-realization. The civilization which aims at this utmost perfection never indulges in creating unwanted things, and such a perfect civilization prepares men only to accept the bad necessities of life or to follow the principle of the best use of a bad Bargain. Our material bodies and our lives in that connection are bad bargains. But the living entity is actually because the living entity is actually spirit. And spiritual advancement of the living entity is absolutely necessary. Human life is intended for the realization. <coughs> of this important factor. And one should act accordingly, accepting only the bad necessities of life and depending more on God's gift without diversion of human energy for any other purpose, such as being mad for material enjoyment. The materialistic advancement of civilization is called the civilization can anyone guess it who's not looking at it? That's Cash only you, Gokula. And it's maybe. Ah, uh, uh, no, not exactly. Although Prabhupada used that term a lot. Mm -hmm. civilization <laughs> of... The materialistic advancement of civilization is called the civilization of the demons. 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 Mm -hmm. Is that what he said? That's what it said. Yeah, I said it. Gokula said it also. I was 
closer to him, I saw her name. I didn't hear another person. I didn't hear say, oh, sorry, you both get oh, okay. honors. <laughs> the materialistic advancement of civilization is called the civilization of the demons, which ultimately ends in wars and scarcity. The transcendentalist is specifically warned herewith to be fixed in mind, so that even if there is difficulty in plain living, in high thinking, he will not budge even an inch from his stark determination. For a transcendentalist, it is a suicidal policy to be intimately in touch with the sense gratifiers of the world, because such a policy will frustrate the ultimate gain of life. Sukadev so Goswami met Maharaj Pritchett when the latter felt the necessity for such a meeting. It is the duty of a transcendentalist to help persons who desire real salvation and to support the cause of salvation. One might note that Sukadev Goswami never met Maharaj Pritchett while he was ruling as a great king. For a transcendentalist, the mode of activity is explained in the next sloka. For a transcendentalist, the mode of activity is explained in the next sloka. Anyone who's not looking at it want to try to guess what those mode what that mode of activity is for transcendentalists? Uh, <laughs> the hint is that it's simple living. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, that's what it is, but it's pretty simple. I'll just give us in a, a what do they call it, a preview. When there are ample earthly flats to lie on, what is the, the necessity of cots and beds? When one can use his arms, what is the necessity of a pillow? When one can use the palms of his hands, what is the necessity of varieties of utensils? When there's ample covering of the skins of trees, what is the necessity of clothing? I can just see a starting trend in the way yeah. how people... Well, Prabhupada makes it practical in the sense that, you know, why do we need to buy clothes? Right. You know, there's so many clothes. Did you everywhere. Yeah. Prabhupada try to pick up the color. I mean, people are always dropping off clothes here. It's like their big charity. They bring us all their old clothes and donate them, you know. Half of them we take to the Goodwill and Jacob's Well. I, I, I guarantee if we start putting bark on, <laughs> it would be a trend eventually. <laughs> Does anybody know how they use tree bark anyway? I picture slabs of Somebody bark. told me recently that uh, they tried it. Oh, that was uh, right enough, my Roger. Somehow I saw him somewhere on uh, you know, the internet, and that's what he said. He said, do you think you can wear a tree bar? He said, I tried it, um, it's pretty rough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's you know, one thing we were just talking about it, like, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. you glance over this way, there's a whole table filled <laughs> with all different flowers and leaves, and we just feel so grateful that we can use the bounty of Nutella instead of spending so much money to buy flowers. And most of those flowers you buy, they come from Ecuador and Colombia, mm -hmm. you know, thousands of miles away. So, I don't know. I just They're also poison. They're sprayed with so many insecticides and herbicides while they're growing and even to get them here. And then they go through customs a lot of times. They're also shh, humiliated. Yeah, yeah. And just about the bark, I mean, they, it's possible to grow uh, claws of trees in Russia, indeed, there's like villages. It's just that you boil the bark and you make a stri stripes of very fine like Strips. paper, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's very thin. It's like it's like, almost like cotton. It's very mm -hmm. like paper. Mm -hmm. Something like that. In, in Asia and Africa and the Pacific Islands they make a bark cloth. You can oh, make all the famous pictures of wearing those leaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
they do make cloth out of bark if you, when you strip it then and beat it. Yeah, they probably the same, they just thin it when they use it like crabs in it probably. Yeah, you know, people have time to do things like that. <laughs> <laughs> have no time because you know, everybody has to run around and make money to go and buy it from Walmart who imports it from China. Mm -hmm. Up in Tennessee, uh, they, there's several like, you know, small uh, sawmills and when they are, uh, you know, they skim the, the, the tree to make the, the log uh, for making lumber, there's an outside piece that's, you know, about that thick and it's the length of the tree and half of its bark and that's used for firewood. We used to go on collecting. That's how I got my iron. Oops. You got his hand. Any other comments about this earth or simple living and high thinking? Well, that's my class tomorrow. So I mean, on Tuesday. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we just gave you a you know preview you of what we did. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe something in other ways. I guess the main point being that. Uh, you know, the fruit of the workers of the world are completely misleading everyone. And somehow have a, you know, we are trying to set an example, but we're such a small entity. And occasionally someone comes and films and, you know, puts it up on YouTube. You know, ISKCON certainly has its YouTube presence, Facebook presence. So many of the people of the world, you know, they're simply looking at the internet. So we have a small presence. Sometimes it looks like a big, we have a big presence, presence. When, you know, we ourselves look at it and think, oh, you know, we're so big, we have so many things, I can't even comprehend them all. But in reality, we're so small compared to everything else in the world, and everything else in the world that's on the internet. It's just, uh, so people, it's rare to come across at the same time, when people come across it, it's a kind of a new phenomenon within the last decade that many people become devotees, not from meeting devotees in person and then going to a physical center or, you know, a physical preaching center or a physical place and having uh, uh, association and direction in a physical and mental type of way. It's all mental over the internet, where they meet, and they see, and they hear, and they read, and it's a variety of gurus, considering that the person speaking or writing, giving uh, instruction or analysis or something, is influencing that person. So therefore, people can get quite mixed up because you have a, a, a large variety of things out there just in the ISKCON world. Mm -hmm. And then when you dabble in the Gaudiya Vaishnava world, in the Vaishnava world, in the uh, Hindu world, or in the religious world in general, I don't know how people can assimilate it all and come out, you know, with a, a distinct course of action. You know, it's, it, it becomes like armchair speculators, Prabhupada used to say. People simply sit and speculate and talk. But as far as actually involving faith and doing becomes, you know, something else. We only have time for smoking a pipe and sitting there and, and, and thinking about it and then having discourse with other people sitting around smoking a pipe and talking about it. It comes a speculative world. Now, occasionally, and maybe even quite often nowadays, I mean, you get people that stumble into our temple like Angie, but then you see she's traveling to see another place. Then when she gets there, it wasn't exactly what she expected that was on the internet. And then she goes to our temple, but then she wants to meet somebody who is a little bit controversial on our this kind of world now because of their views on things. Yeah, but you know, she's like influenced by so many different people. And where will one take one's stand? 
who will one find as a guru? I mean, people need a guru, but if we never have a guru, instead we have tons of friends and advisors that just are rattling our brain with their synopsis of things, then when will we ever have a guru who we can sit down and simply accept his siddhanta, his philosophical conclusions of the truth? Um, when we uh, speak on Prabhupada's behalf, we present Srila Prabhupada's siddhanta, his philosophical conclusions on the absolute truth. That's our duty as his disciple. And one has to be, one has to be trained in that. One can read the books just like a medical, a person seeking some medical uh, knowledge can read medical books. And we see that happening in the world all the time. And then people sort of, sort of pose themselves as somebody knowledgeable about medicine. Whereas if they start to practice it, they'll very soon be labeled a quack. Because they never practiced under a bona fide doctor who could teach them, who had practical experience and could show them how to apply the books. So similarly, we may, we may read, but if we don't read in the association of the author's disciples, the author's representatives and study under that author, then it's very it's more than possible that one will be misled in trying to apply it because it's, it's simply the way I think about it without understanding how it was practically applied by the guru. So, uh, it's a big difference, just like uh, Mother uh, Madhava Priya was saying, gee whiz, when I came to the temple, they told me I couldn't paint for two years, and that I had to first learn to become a devotee. You couldn't what? Okay. Couldn't, she couldn't you know, do what was our occupation before. And many times they told that to devotees, like uh, Mangala Nanda, they told them, oh no, give away your guitar. <laughs> Actually, I found that good. They were? Yeah, well, I think he liked it too. I didn't exactly, when I came, they were just trying to get me to come because not too many people came. There was one guy there, his name was Dr. Mike, he was the first person from Louisiana, his daddy was the dean at Southeastern University in Hammond. And so Dr. Mike was there, and then I came with another devotee whose legal name I don't remember, but he was initiated, Amsu, and his wife. And they had two small children. And so they couldn't stay in the building we rented because there wasn't room for them a family. So the temple was actually renting a house for them. And the temple president would have to go buy some special food because his wife couldn't deal with just what we were cooking. So, and it was simple things like peas. He would have to go buy her peas because I don't know, at that time we wasn't using frozen peas. Later it became a phenomenon where everybody uses frozen peas. So I remember one, some of the things, but it wasn't just peas, it was different ever frozen vegetables, like she needed. And you know, I guess we wasn't offering it at that time. So me and you know, Amsu went on to get initiated. She ended up getting initiated. They ended up moving to Canada. They stayed involved for some time. I don't know what ever happened to Amsu. I don't, his daughter, I think one of the daughters became a diplomat somewhere. And, uh, but the wife, later on, like after 40, you know, in her forties, she went to medical school and became a doctor. So, uh, but I don't know what happened to them. They were local New Orleans people, and I thought at one time I heard they even moved back, but somehow I just lost complete touch with them. So Amsu stayed. Dr. Michael left, and he went to California and later got initiated. Machia does. And I don't know what happened to Machi Das. He's a musician. He played guitar nicely. It was nice when he was there because he played guitar and would chant on the cushion. And then other people came. There was a whole string of people that came. One of the boys came back to Alex and he had a lot of good karma. You know, he was college educated. He was very healthy and, 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 and big and strong. And, and he, uh, he sounded like Alex Presley. 
And he could distribute books because all the ladies would buy books from him. Because he was handsome, he sounded good, and he had no problem selling books, you know. So uh, we were initiated together. And he was like a guy who was always joyful. It's like that was his thing about Krishna consciousness was, you know, ecstasy. I mean, he was, and he would preach like that, you know. So, I mean, he was, you know, he was pretty influential and enamoring because he was preaching to people to become ecstatic and happy and joyful in the world. And I was into yoga more, you know. I was into trying to control my own mind and senses, but that was like the only thing I could hear in Prabhupada's books, you know, to control my senses. The ecstasy part, I don't know, you know, I, I heard that, but, you know, other things... Even pastimes kind of like just one and one and out the other. It was only stuff about controlling my mind and senses that really kind of sunk in. So then when Prabhupada gave us our names, he named me Yogendra Vandana, which is sort of a take on yoga. You know, yoga and Indra, but it means king of yoga. So he put Yogendra Vandana, I mean, one who was worshipped by the great yogis or the kings of yoga. It's a name for Krishna, Bhakti, you know, Thakur uses in a, uh, his famous song that we use the morning melody for and sometimes uh, Sri Rai chants the, the first stanza of it at Mongolati when he's singing after he does uh, uh, um, I think it's either after Guru Bhastikam or after uh, the Panchatapa Mantra he sings that first line for years they sung it in Vrindavan but then they, they went back to just the the way Srila Prabhupada uh, showed us to do it because it was uh, it was a suggestion by one of his god brothers to chant that in Vrindavan. It was the only place it was really chanted. Sometimes it'd be chanted there, the temple of it. And Krishna Balram Temple, they did it for quite a number of years. And then when he became a competitor of this kind, they simply went back to what Srila Prabhupada uh, originally showed us in that matter. But I uh, had to do it as far as uh, uh, chanting the uh, Mongolati songs. Uh, oh, golly, that made me forget what I was talking about here. Um, but then the other devotee, Alex, was it? He got his Oh, yeah, so then he, Prabhupada gave Alex the name Ananda Bardana from the same song. Ananda Bardana means one who's always increasing in ecstasy. So I mean, we just laughed. We thought, wow, they're on these names. Was it by the mail? Came up. Yeah, it was by the mail. Yeah. You know, we just, the uh, temple president sent a recommendation letter. And we and we sent him some beads and neck. No, we didn't send the neck beads. We sent just the Jaffa beads. And Prabhupada sent back the Jaffa beads and sent back our names. And he gave a little thing, you know. He said, uh, I always go on Sankaton and, you know, you'll be happy and your life will be perfect. Something like that, you know. Always go on Sankaton. You follow the regular good principles and always go and say, Tony, your life will be perfect. And then later on, when I took second initiation, that's when he said, uh, there's no need for everybody to take second initiation. There are four classes of men, uh, especially if they can't get up for Mongolati. <laughs> that's what he said, you know. So, what year is that? 1974 for second initiation, 72 for first initiation. Uh, so, uh, and at that time it was the same thing, uh, you know, there wasn't a big Gaudi of Vaishnava world, there was no internet presence, so in America, but there was a big yoga world like out there, and you know, there were a lot of other Indian gurus coming. There was the little boy guru, you know, who claimed to be the incarnation of Krishna, and then there was Maharishi Yogi, mm -hmm. who still has a big, mm -hmm. a big college in the state of Iowa. Mm -hmm. that teaches uh, Ayurvedic science and, and regular academics. It's a, a business, college. Business, business also. Business, yeah, business. And he taught, that, taught the meditation practice where, you know, you have to pay money and you can advance through it. It's just like uh, a school, uh, a private school where you pay. So then the more you advance and learning how to do whatever they do, their meditation practice, you know, the more it costs, and supposedly you're able to learn how to levitate. Now, why I would pay so much money just to raise my butt a few inches off the ground, I don't know, you know, but, uh, 
people do, because I guess it, you know, it's, not, it's mystical, it's a sort of very meager mystical perfection. <laughs> and at one time, some devotee asked, some, you know, at one person, there's several people that became devotees, actually Madhava Das, Das's wife is a disciple of, of Maharishi Yogi, and went there, and even Madhava Das, Das has some land up there where he went up there to try to preach. Wasn't, the Beatles, didn't feel they, himself uh, real successful, huh? The Beatles went to Rishikesh. Beatles went to him first before they came to Prabhupada. Uh -huh. And then they, there was, many people felt that when John Lennon sang that song. Sexy Sadie. Well, I, that was, I was thinking of the part about uh, the man on the hill who had his mouth. That was Paul McCartney. Yeah, so but John they Lennon, thought that that referred to my no, Yogi, that he anyway, had nothing to offer. The song Sexy mm -hmm. Sadie was originally Maharishi. Oh. He came along and go through. And so, uh, <laughs> I'll be. Uh, but also, yeah, so the, the secretary. The body, some of these devotees reveal some of those mantras, and basically yes. they're just root uh, of uh, Vedic, uh, you know, Sanskrit mantras like Klim, Aim, mm -hmm. you know, root mantras, you know, that people chant. When Prabhupada was in Atlanta, the secretary to Maharishi came and um, he surrendered to Prabhupada. Really? He said that Maharishi always had um, a, you know, some other practices that he was doing. And he was reading the Brahma Samhita, he was doing things like that. Because his Bhagavad Gita only goes up to the sixth chapter. Mm -hmm. and, and he kept saying, there's more, there's more for you, but I, I'm not, you know, prepared to teach. And then finally, you know, he kept bothering Maharishi, you know, I want to know more. I want to know what else you're doing. He said, you have to go to Bhaktivedanta Swami. I can't give you what you want. What was that? He was the secretary to Maharishi. Mm -hmm. Then he sent them to Shiva Prabhupada. It was, it was He's big. The, I mean, they would have conventions like in the Houston, when the Houston, uh, in Houston there was a, there was a, a dome, yeah. a closed dome that they played football in and had conferences in. So they did one of those things there and the devotees would go there and sell Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Because, you know, they would, they would say, hey, Bhagavad Gita, just like Maharishi Yogi, they wouldn't proclaim him as the author. People would they proclaim Prabhupada as the author and say, Bhagavad Gita, like, you know, Maharishi Yogi reads, you know, and they would sell lots of Bhagavad Gita. And then there was the Yogi Bhajan. Yogi Bhajan was a Sikh guru, wore a turban, and him and Prabhupada had a good relationship, but he couldn't get Prabhupada to come to some interfaith, interfaith event that he was having. Uh, and that was an interfaith event amongst the Hindus, if I'm not mistaken. Prabhupada didn't give any credence because he said if they don't accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of God, they'll never make any uh, peace in this world. We do a lot of interfaith preaching nowadays with the groups in America, the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, so many Christian sects. And very seldom do the Catholics attend to the ones I go, but I did go to the one where they attended, boy, the priest and the bishop gave me really a sour look. Because yeah. we were we had catered to Basad and when they came through. And some of the Jewish people wouldn't take. But maybe that's because, you know, someone's so particular about something being kosher. Well there was that, there was also because we uh, they knew that we offered it to our deities. Yeah, Other gods. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, uh, there were uh, different people that that certainly uh, visited uh, um, Yogi Bhajan and he later became devotee. So anyway, these yoga groups were quite prominent, as well as philosophical groups. There was the Philosophical Society of Self-Realization, of Self-Actualization, and so mm -hmm. many. There were so many groups, I mean physical groups. You know, there was no internet, but there was a lot of like physical organization that was going on that were, you know, competing in the field of teaching self-realization. And, and then there was, you know, Srila Prabhupada. So the devotees had a lot to weave through, to do that with the speaker, weaving through the whole religious world, you know? you know? But nowadays it's tough too, and a lot of people, they, it, it's done over the internet primarily. 
So it's an interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So how in the world, you know, we're becoming, you know, we, we simple, but then at the same time, in the field of communications, things are a little bit sophisticated. And, you know, back in the simple days, you would meet somebody and you would uh, pick their brain, so to speak, to understand what they knew and what they had to give, and the same for them to understand, you know, what you had in your brain. And, uh, but, uh, and, and I guess people still do that, but it takes the form of writing, but you lose body language. And in the course of doing that, it said that uh, when people talk on the phone, there was some statistical thing that people would understand a certain percentage of what was said. But when you talk to people personally, you understand more from their body language, and tone of voice, etc., than you do from the actual words that are spoken. So it's in interesting. I would, you know, people who study communications, you know, of course the written word is there. I think the problem is uh, that I heard some academicians talking about is that when these things are discussed in the internet, a lot of times it really doesn't go into depth and research. So it's not like an academic study. So you're only getting, uh, and you think you're getting a lot, but you're just getting a little. Well, whereas to uh, you know uh, 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 a book about something, just like when a person uh, uh, um, does their PhD studies, ultimately they had to take whatever they're studying. They had to take a certain topic, and a lot of times a little bit new, but something, some topic, and they had to do research and write on that topic. And that topic, that, that study, then is studied by ever masters in the field. And it has to be able to offer something, you know, uh, uh, beneficial and practical and uh, uh, enlightening to that realm of study. And if it, if it meets that, then they, they'll get an approval. You know, that they have to become such a master at something that they can uh, speak upon a specific thing about it uh, is, is a... Uh, like a world-class master in that subject. So they went to speak about our Siddhanta in our presentation. It's like, you know, if, if we go on the internet, even if, you know, sometimes you get like a big long thing to read, it seems like, oh, it's a lot, you know? But you look at Srila Prabhupada, the Siddhanta is in 12 cantos. I mean, when I first looked at it, I wasn't exactly a bookworm growing up. <laughs> I think I've mentioned that before. I used to like to be outside and doing things and they didn't have a great interest in just reading a whole lot. And although it was always drummed into me, you know, the importance of it, and, you know, you'd have to do it in school anyway. And sometimes I would do it for fun, but it certainly wasn't academic reading. Uh, so, when, you know, when they give you not just the Gita, that's 700 verses, but still it was a fairly big book. And you think, wow, everything's here. But then they hand you 12 cantos of Shema Bhagavatam, 18,000 verses, you know, 18 big volumes. And at first it was printed with 60 volumes. And I'm like, man, I'm going to digest all that, you know? That wasn't even the 11th and 12th canto, right? 60 may have been the 11th. Oh, yeah, you may be right. It may have been only up to where Prabhupada translated when it was in. Mm -hmm. I think that was a 60 volume session. Now, originally, the Chaitanya Charnamrita was 17 volumes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looked like a lot to master, you know, to a, a kid like me, you know. But, uh, I mean, we certainly had our scholars, uh, you know, Rita Yananda Maharaj, he could uh, go through it. He had, a, you know, a brain for that sort of thing, you know. Him and Heather Jaipataka Maharaj always fascinated me, you know, I mean, he could write and read, you know, comprehend a subject really quick and speak on it. For me, you know, reading, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd read the same paragraph two and three times, you know, just to comprehend it, you know. But to speak about listening to Prabhupada on tape, you know, we would always listen to him on tape. And so then you're trying to understand what he's saying, so he says something. And then you wander off thinking about it. He said that? What does that mean? And you still think about it. But the tape keeps playing. Right. Because, you know, it's not just you doing it and stopping it and listening. It's, you know, it's a bunch of 
of other students sitting around listening. So you can't stop it. You may say, what did he say? What did he say? And, you know, somebody would talk. But, uh, <laughs> so then, you know, you kind of think that you got a little grasp of it, or maybe you have no grasp of it. Like, I can't figure that out. But, so then you go back to listening, but Prabhupada's sentences ahead of you, then, you know. So it always took a while to, like, I didn't understand a full lecture until I went to, I went to the Jagannath Ratha Yatra in San Francisco in 1975. And Prabhupada was giving really? a lecture. Really? Yeah, and I was out in the crowd. And that was the first lecture that I ever heard Prabhupada give from beginning to end, where I felt I had fully I remember the whole lecture. You know? Like maybe a couple of lectures, and then finally collect. You know, just <laughs> everybody had a little bit of. But after a couple of days, it just collects. But when I first, I couldn't. I didn't like that the temple president would read the Krishna book. You know, I got finally. I, I got. You know, I could say to some degree a little coerced in moving into the temple, but it was completely my will. I mean, they couldn't make you do what you didn't want to do. You know, I mean, that was, that was the nature of the everyday red-blooded American, you know. Not even, you know, you know, people would walk out on the military, you know. I mean, with the speaking, nobody could make you do what you didn't want to do. So anyway, uh, you know, I was there, I was trying to participate, but, you know, they would want you to do more than what you could do. They wanted me to shave up and go out and preach. And I was thinking, preach? I don't even know what it's all about, you know? I'm going to preach about it. And then I got a shaved head and I'm supposed to be representing it. So I said, that's one thing to go out and chant. All right, so I'm just practicing. But here I am. I'm supposed to go out like some kind of authority and tell people about it? Come on. But yet, you know, they, they would urge you, you know, no, it's very important to distribute Prabhupada's books. And so I could, I understood that because Prabhupada was often writing about, you know, please go out and distribute my books. So I'd go out and do that. And I would, but I would pick people that I felt I was confident to preach to. So I was like going up to all the African-American ladies on Canal Street, generally the older ladies, you know, <laughs> and, and, and getting them to take it back to Godhead Magazine. They were the sweet spot in the beginning. Yeah. The old black ladies. <laughs> They're the most pious people. Remember the first time an Indian guy, I never saw Indian in 1975. I mean, they just started letting them come into the country in the early 70s. You know, the previous bad immigration law never allowed Asians to come in very much. So uh, a guy came up and took a Bhagavad Gita from me. I was like shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, amazing. A lot of things like that. I, but I didn't like that all of a sudden we, because initially if there was one pundit, maybe two, there would chant Sanskrit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we all had to learn Sanskrit. And I didn't want to do that. It took me, uh, uh, you, you don't mean the I script, huh? Huh? You mean the script? Yeah, but yeah probably no, I kind of wanted no, that, but just, then there were too many no, people but, that came. Well, when, when I first joined, it would just be like one or two people that would chant the Sanskrit in the class. With the Roman letters? Yeah. yeah oh, right. Roman letters. Yeah, and we didn't have to, but then Prabhupada said, what if you're selling the books and you don't, they ask you, what's that word? And you go, uh, I just, you know. Kind yeah, of. but you know, I went to that temple on 13th Street and what part of y'all's morning program was that uh, you were chanting Sopanishad yeah. at the Mangalati yeah. almost yeah. every no, third, but so by that time we were already doing those yeah. mantras. Yeah, in the yeah, but in the beginning, no. But yeah, we. That's true, and a lot of temples did that. The Sri Shapanshad, just about every temple I knew, because well, I, I traveled with Vinuga up and down the East Coast, and they were all doing that. And then, for then for a while, we were doing uh, Shishashtaka and also, yeah. yeah. That was after, you know. And then there were some things, even though then you would just learn that. Mantra, like we learned how to sing some Sardava, mm -hmm. you know, and learned certain mantras to sing for the kirtan, you know. But to actually have to read the verse in the Bhagavatam every day, you know, that wasn't necessarily required. And that, that's good. There you go. In, in, in a school, in an ashram, you know, at the temple, you can learn these things. These things are hard to learn just over the internet, you know. You may learn some music you can put on it. You can go to, you know, there's the Bodhi that teach Madonga, the Bodhi that teach Kartal, and you can, a person can learn those things. And you can learn the tunes and 
with the chant different. And so it's got it's got its benefit because how else are you going to reach everybody in the world? And everybody can even drive, can move 75 miles with the speed of 200. I mean, what if you live somewhere in Montana? You know, and, yeah. and so it's 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 a, it's a a good phenomenon that yeah. that's there, but it's so practical in a temple because you have such a great opportunity. You know, there's somebody there who can uh, can teach you and. And it, maybe there's more incentive also for some people. For me, it'd be more incentive to do it on my own. I'd have to be really, really interested. Mm. Really, really interested in it. Otherwise, I just wouldn't have time for it. I'd be doing something else. You know? It's a different world. Man. Different. Yeah. Yeah, the people are more... I mean, like, we, you, just these last couple of times I've had to travel by plane. You see that... You know, it used to be that people would have like different, you know, gradually it was coming like computers and stuff, but now everyone is like this. Mm -hmm. And the, so you, there's no. Even at the red light, nobody honks yeah. their horn at you because they're all looking at yeah. the phone. <laughs> exactly. But the, there's no conversation between people. No. Mm -hmm. And it's actually um, now if you're just sitting in a lobby waiting and you. You know, just happen to ask someone a simple question, they're like really annoyed that you broke their trance. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, like, we're all just in, you know, within our heads, our own, our own space. It's really a, a very strange. I, I, I saw some people sitting in a food court at a table, and all the four people, five people, they were just sitting there looking at their phones. And they published this on the internet. And they don't talk to each other. They print, print, they publish cartoons about this all the time. Do they really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but it's definitely the benediction curse, you know, because yeah, this so definitely much benediction. is, you know. Community. Like Rumar gives a class, a Facebook class, every single day. And you wouldn't be able to see and it. And thousands of, by the next day, there's three, four, five thousand views. So, yeah, it, it's, I'm not denying that it's... Yeah, it's definitely. Well, we had to raise money for Tages to put in a sprinkler system. And so I just advertised it on Facebook. I went and looked this morning to see who gave. I noticed Angie was the first giver. She gave $15. But that was last so night. So is she just, coming back or not? Day. Is she coming back or not? That's her plan. Yeah, she's so, waiting to get a ticket in June. Um... Yeah, yeah right, I, I, you know, at one point I was asking... It costs more if you just get it. At one point I was wondering, you know, what Prabhupada would think. Because he didn't like us to use phones. He, did, he said everything you should write, put it in writing. And he really, he would see our uh, financial statements and see how, how much our phone bills were. He would be really upset. Well, we all put things in writing. Yeah, so, but anyway... Um, mm -hmm. I saw, I was, one time I was, it was a, back, you know, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, Jai Doita and Ridayananda in Atlanta, and I said, well, what do you think Prabhupada would think about computer? I was, I was thinking maybe somebody's first Vyasa Puja day, give him a laptop, you know, for, for the Vyasa. And, because um, there is the pluses part, you know, like you said, and all his books are on it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, Jai Doita tomorrow said, at one point, you know, there was teletype, you know, I don't know if they still use that or not, mm -hmm. but, but a teletype was the main way of communicating from, from, it was sort of like a telegraph, but it was more immediate. And, um, you know, from like India to, you know, Europe and from Europe to here. So someone suggested that we put teletype in every temple. And uh, Prabhupada said, <laughs> it'll just be used for Pajapa. Be another way for you to just waste your time talking rumors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just read this quote yesterday. You, <laughs> you did? Yesterday. Yeah, it was yeah. telepaths and robots that basically no one will use it for gossiping. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I didn't even know it was, you know, I just was relying on it. Well, I mean, it is a fact, there's so much gossip. And then, you know, and I, the thing that I remember, because I hadn't been around. You know, devotees, I was up, I mean, I was around the devotees in the sense that I lived about an hour and a half from the Vancouver Temple. Every month they were taking money out of my bank account. I would go there once a month. But I wasn't really, you know, I, I didn't have computer. I didn't know about things like chakra at that time. 
these internet stuff. And I could see the problem with it was, like with the Islam World Review, say, would be a comparison, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not even going to compare it to a BTG article, where it's had all these editorial, um, you know, you have, like I remember Balvanta wrote an article for the BTG, he was furious that Satru Panjaya Dutta had edited his words, it changed his words. Mm -hmm. And um, so with, with Chakra, there was, and, you know, in Iskand World Review also, I always felt it was kind of um, sort of a propaganda rag for some of the top guns, you know, myself, and so, sort of, you know, I always had a, a, a thing about it, but at least there was some sense of uh, the institution had some editorial control over it. You weren't just talking all these other issues that mm -hmm. go out. And, and Chakra was very, I think that was its downfall, was that it was so open, to, it was very democratic. And I just kept thinking, you would never read these kind of things in, the, in with ISKCON World Review, or this is not a good thing. You know, there's no, and, and if someone has something, an article, on uh, something that's considered like a, a, a cyber magazine, like Chakra or something like that, um, then you ha it gives it credence, some credibility. Mm -hmm. and, but actually these people were, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes printing just actual garbage, you know? And, uh, well, and, you know, it, it becomes like when, we, when you go to the store, I guess it's still there today, you know, they there's those yeah. newspapers that and I look at them just fake news and time. people get them for entertainment. Yeah. yeah. Star Globe. So but it, you know, everybody knew that it was just for entertainment. So but now on the internet nobody can distinguish between right. fake news and the real news, you know. I, I I heard this or I didn't know about it, but I just found out about it yesterday, I think it was, that the Republicans and, and Trump had actually ordered this done. He, they slurred Nancy yeah. Pelosi's words. Slowed it down. And if you yeah. see it, you think, wow, she does have maybe she, something wrong with her. Oh, okay. her it is, or she's intoxicated, or maybe her That's getting teeth. crazy. And then, then you see the real clip. And then it's they had changed it. And if, if you didn't know, you would think this was real. Yeah. And Trump actually ordered it. turns out he actually ordered it done. Well, you know, but they're, 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 it becomes a game. They're just playing with one another, seeing who can. I mean, it's not pleasant. It's it's actually just you know disgusting politics. But they're just they they're doing it to one another, seeing who can out the one another. Yeah. Just like years ago, when Abraham Lincoln was debating, I think Stephen Douglas or somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's yeah, always yeah. been done in, amongst you know politicians. He won the debate because he made everybody laugh. He he he, he said said first of all, I wouldn't debate anybody wearing a sh a, a, a lady's shirt because he had one of those Eastern ruffled shirts on, you know. And he was a Illinois backwoodsman, you know. And, you know, and they were and it was not being done in New York; it was being done, you know, like in Illinois or someplace. And so the crowd got a big kick out of it, and that's all they remembered. Practically. Yeah. How he had put the other guy down and shamed him, and you know, so that, that's what they, that's what they, they, and that's what I, that's what pe that's what yeah, I think yeah. this verse is about. Our minds get all absorbed in all this worldly stuff, yeah. and you go to bed thinking about it, yeah. whether you like it or you don't like it. <laughs> Whereas actually, we should be absorbed in you know transcendental matters. Mm -hmm. As long as we've touched on politics, you know, Narendra Modi won the president. The name. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. 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 He said, well, that another gay, not married. That's why, that's why he said, he said if, you know, one of, in his campaign, he says that you don't have to worry about me, right. you know, uh, taking money to give to my family or to this or that because it's only me. Something like that. I mean, I, you know, I'm, 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 he, 
it, just take the gist of it that he was making the point that he didn't have a lot of connections. I mean, the guy grew up poor. He used to sell, you know, tea at the train track. So he doesn't have all these big connections that he's obligated to. You know, people that have given him money and have helped him on his mm -hmm. campaign, etc. You know, he, so that was his point that, you know, I can go after all the corruption because, you know, I'm not afraid, you know, I, if, if you get rid of me, you just get rid of me. You know, I don't have a bunch of people that, I'm, that are, are going to be crying over me and this and that. Mm. And so, I mean, he, so he has, he has and he's, he, you know, he's still a, uh, like these Madeves, he's still a celebrate, you know, uh, country. Or, that's what his guru told him to do, rather than take sannyas, huh. was to, uh, you know, help the people. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to, don't quote me exactly that there are things like that you could research and find out, I'm sure, just on, what is it called, Wikipedia or like that, just yeah. put his name in there and they will tell you that, you know, what he, and his situation actually is. He used to sell chai. Yeah. <laughs> That's, chai that was, he didn't eat. I mean, in India, I mean, everybody has to get out there and do something when you don't eat. <laughs> Nobody, you know, I mean, you can go begging and they get something. But, uh, and there's a lot of other people bagging too. His father had a tea stall, I read, and then he used to just hustle tea at the train station. And mm -hmm. also somehow there was some political office nearby, and that's when he was young, he got, became aware of like social issues, like, and it must have been people that were like activists. And, and how the, uh, his people, for, you know, the, the, the Hindu people, they, they didn't have much of a voice, except from that one political organization, which was uh, mm -hmm. really, uh, you know, considered to be for right wing. I mean, they were you know, one of their members was responsible for uh, assassinating Gandhi. So you know, the Congress Party, which brought India independence, was always a secular party, and so the BJP, the you know, the party that supports Hindu rights. They, they, uh, you know, they were demonized, practically speaking. You know, it's just right wing. You know, Hindu politics. You know, you know, they'll never keep the country together. You know, so that was Congress's stand from Indira Gandhi to her sons to so many of them. It's only since Modi and maybe one other one decided was elected from the, from the. Uh, a party that you know, that doesn't pretend to represent the, the, the majority of Hindu people. Anyway, Hare Krishna. Thank you very Hare much. Hare Shri Krishna. Hare Shri Krishna. Shri Krishna had to, had to deal with all that stuff, but Lord Chaitanya didn't. He refused. 